Good morning and good afternoon. Thanks everybody for attending today. I'm Brad Horn, the CEO and co-founder of Portable Technology Solutions. And I'm joined today with my co-founder, Dan Peluso. And behind the scenes, uh, we have Lindsay, who is our head of marketing. Um, she's making all this happen, put it all together. So thanks, Lindsay, for joining us today and uh, you know making us look good, hopefully. Anyway, so uh, for those that don't know, Dan and I started the business, how many years ago, Dan, was it? Well, uh, 24, 24 years ago. Yeah, 24 years ago, um, we basically shared an office space, both working for other folks, and we founded the business at the young age of the 30s. And uh, we've been doing it ever since, happily uh, working together. I handle the operations, the marketing, and sales, and Dan is the genius behind the software. Uh, the plan today is just to do a quick repeat of what we did in 2023 and then go on to more of our vision, where we're going in 2024, to give our end users and our partners just an idea of what they can expect over the next year. So uh, next slide. So 2023, um, you know, not a big year in releases, uh, you know, on the Tracer Plus and the Clearstream side, but we had a lot of stuff structurally going on. Um, we made some really good hardware integrations uh, on the, RFID side, this is really a sales thing that we pushed in, I would say, this came to you sideways, TSL, Honeywell, Zebra wearables, these are new devices we were excited about, our partners were excited about, and our end users were excited about, and we built that into Tracer Plus. Dan, could you just give us a little idea of what that effort is, what the processes you guys go through when we make these decisions and come to you with these ideas like, hey, yeah. we want this to work with Tracer Plus. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's a good segue into the other conversation we can have about who, who decides this, why do we decide it, things like that. And you could probably talk a little bit about that. But for a hardware integration, so Tracer Plus, of course, is, is meant to run on any Android, any iOS device. Um, but with, with OEMs like Zebra or TSL or Honeywell, they, you know, they put some extra features in there like barcode scanning or RFID reading um, that we want to take advantage of. Right. So now all of a sudden we're not just a generic application, we're a generic application plus, you know, that integration. Um, but that comes with some effort. So we have to we have to make those decisions carefully. Sometimes that's a technical reason, right? Like an RFID reader, there's not really a concept of a wedge. So we would we that's an easier technical decision. But sometimes there's a sales or or channel reason to do it, right? And I think Brad, maybe you could you could even uh, talk yeah, about Yeah, obviously that. from the partner level, we want to enable them to sell the hardware. Um, we want to give all of our customers best in class hardware to use with their applications. But I think we're kind of picky in the direction we go and what we choose. I want to go sideways a little bit here, but I don't know if everybody or anyone got the go to meeting error that we all experienced before this event. That's why we're really selective about the APIs and the software that may we may have to access to use our software. We really try to keep it low level because if anyone saw, we were getting errors to get into this, and that's really frustrating. That would you know triple our support calls if we opened ourselves up to all of these other software systems and clouds. So um, you know, Dan, you guys really look at those APIs pretty and the SDKs pretty closely. What's that process like? Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, one of the biggest hurdles that we we have to consider is the licensing. You know, we operate in a in a sort of a trial mode, um, and we need licensing to be you know settled before we can integrate to something like that. And also dependency, right? We limit our dependencies on outside software both for security reasons and for reliability reasons, and those are huge considerations. So, you know, to to take some off brand you know, Chinese or other uh, OEM manufactured barcode scanner and integrate to it. We, we wouldn't really do that because there's a lot of security risk. There's a lot of a lot of um, dependability risk. So so those are the things we definitely think about, aside from, you know, your side with the sales and channel and, and, and those considerations. Yeah, so that, and I would say it's not an easy decision, really. Yeah, and I would say 50 to 60 percent of the devices that we even think that we want to work with, you guys say no to after looking you know, under the hood a little bit about into the SDKs and the APIs. You just, this isn't ready. And we kind of. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep, yep, yep. Um, the next one, not many people see what we're doing. Um, again, because Tracer Plus is a platform that works on all these different devices. And we try to, you know, we have a perpetual version. We have a subscription version. Uh, we work in some of the most secure areas in the world with government. Um, we spend a lot of time on OS updates, security updates, and you know Z Zebra or Honeywell or these other folks, they have hardware upgrades. 
um, over the years, Dan, how many of like Google, Apple that we're working with? You guys spend a lot of time on these these upgrades. This last year. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. That I mean, that landscape is ever evolving for good reasons, right? A lot of these uh, are for security updates or privacy concerns, like even something as simple as Google saying, "Hey, your app needs permission to access the camera." That becomes a big deal for us because in in uh, devices without a, a barcode reader, we allow the camera to be used as a barcode scanner. Oh, yeah. um, but Google finally said, hey, we can't just have any app accessing the camera for good reason, right? But that requires a change. One of the things that you know, I always think is a huge advantage of Trish Plus is we, we take on the brunt of that as opposed to you know, our customer's IT department or, or some outsourced uh, app development team who might not keep up as well as we do. So we have that commitment not only to the OS, uh, migrations between you know going from palm to windows mobile to android and ios uh, but also the upgrades in between and that's to me that's a huge benefit to our customers uh, to not have to worry about that yeah and just a little side story i remember probably a couple of years ago maybe it's longer than that time's moving quick these days but i sat in a um, isv event with one of our hardware suppliers and back in the days of windows mobile it was, it was pretty easy for anyone to go out and create an application and windows mobile may support that app for eight years well, with Android and iOS, I mean, you might have to redevelop in three months. So, and now you factor in all the hardware and then BYOD and specifically what you said about the camera. I remember there was an, I think it was an iOS upgrade that, you know, we knew about that forced us to quickly go in and make some updates. So they had access to the barcode scanning for a large organization's BYOD cameras. And then at the same point we heard, you know, through sideways through other partners that they got shut down. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. It happens a lot because they're they're out. If they outsource the development, that guy, you know, your uncle's friend or whoever you hired to do this app, uh, all of a sudden disappears or, you know, whatever retires, right? Um, or an intern creates. Don't have that source. You hear that all critical. the time. I mean, these are business critical <laughs> apps, so you know that's a risk that you know I wouldn't personally be willing to take. But um, that's where Tracer Plus becomes, you know, a big advantage. Okay. So the next bullet point. Um, those who've been following us closely know that over the last few years, we've introduced a cloud for data storage, data sharing. Um, really, it's become a really big part of the company. And we decided that, you know, we want our demo experience to be more robust. If you demo the apps in the past that we get off the Google Play Store or the App Store, you know, it was really just a front end. So now we actually give a working full demo. So collecting data, and then you can see the data in another country via our cloud demo. Um, so Dan, maybe you can talk a little bit about where that's going, you know, how you guys are migrating everything into our cloud. I know this is really part of the 2023 discussion. Um, I mean, sorry, 2024, but maybe you can just give a little insight of what you guys did with those demo apps. Well, yeah, I mean, one of the things that we did in 2023, which wasn't super exciting and super sexy, but the title of 2023 overview is the frameworks and integrations. Um, a lot of what we did this year laid the groundwork for the future 2024 projects and the demo apps was almost a test of how well we did with that. So the demo apps, uh, you know, were built on Tracer Plus, right? So we had that built in advantage against other competitors um, using the Tracer Plus engine, eating our own dog food, as they say sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. But we built those demo apps to be very cloud friendly because that's what we anticipate in 2024 our customers wanting to do. They're going to want to build their app in Tracer Plus, but be able to sync data, maybe without Tracer Plus Connect locally, but send it to that cloud. So they can get a taste for that with those demo apps. So now a trial user coming in has immediate access through his subscription to get those demo apps. And to be honest, he can collect some data within three minutes, sync it, um, and it's immediately available to anybody who has. Um, you know, a login to their cloud account. And that's, and think, that's been really, really great in 2023, not only 50, to get that groundwork done, but also to prove that, that the idea works. And I think 50% of these demo apps are RFID enabled on the mobile side that work with TSL, Honeywell. I'm not, I'm not sure about Honeywell, but with Zebra definitely and, and TSL. So that's a great demo opportunity for a lot of our partners and our internal sales reps. Um, but one of the bigger things that I don't know if everybody knows about, um, is the idea of us taking, it's almost like our demo apps, but we're packaging them now for resale. Uh, we've been approached multiple times by customers and saying, hey, listen, I really just want to use this little demo app and you know, set it up with a cloud, et cetera, et cetera. And we found out, and we keep on finding out, I think we'd be better at by now after 23 years, but there's a really, a lot of customers out there just need to do these simple things. 
Maybe it's uh, ver verify RFID tags like we're doing the GS1 verify or doing a basic inventory. But um, next slide, Lindsay. I mean, we'll just show what we've done. I mean, I think it's pretty exciting. So um, this is the one that we haven't released yet, but this we spent a lot of time on this in uh, 2023. This is going to be available for our partner community to resell and for our end users to use. And it's it's a it was driven off of some small retail stores that we know personally that you know they had these great POS systems, but they gave them the most crappy and excuse the terminology, but really bad data collection tools like you know pocket scanners that they would have to you know do ASCII file exports into some Excel sheet and then. Yeah, it was really convoluted. So Dan, can you just talk a little bit about the process, what you guys did to create these and how we kind of use our advantage to do this and how we're going to do more of it? Yeah, I mean, you, you kind of nailed it with the, it's similar to the cloud demo apps, except that um, Tracer Plus, you know, as a family of products has had long had the concept of a branded option, right? So we've offered um, our resellers and partners the publishing option Right, so you can build your app in Tracer Plus, but then brand it with your own logos, your own app name. You can even create it uh, to be compatible to the Play Store. Um, so we took that concept for ourselves with this Count Quick inventory and also the GS1 app, if we talk about that. Um, so now it's a standalone application with its own, you know, cloud instance, um, which also means it's separately licensable and things like that. Um, so that, you know, that's all the advantages we, again, sort of had that built-in advantage because we had this publisher option available. And if any of, your, of, of our partners don't know about it, you know, that's definitely ask your sales reps about it because, um, yeah. you know, that could I think be one of the exciting things is we did not really do any development. We all, we just configured our own tools, obviously in the cloud, we're not there yet where we can configure it, but that's something we can talk about for 2024. But it's pretty exciting that we had our own team create this. And just like our customers can create OEMs and apps with our publisher tools, we published our own couple apps. And the next one we did, just to talk about a little bit is really vertical and a big niche. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, and this one we're actually seeing a lot of uh, pickup from our partner community um, going out to their retail customers. It's really not retail customers, but suppliers. Can you just talk a little bit about this one, Dan, and what their you know the the problem they had and what we were trying to solve? Yeah, well, this is an interesting one too because it was a you know big elephant in the retail room, uh, being Walmart. I think I could mention by name. Yes, uh, put out a mandate for all of their suppliers, even mom and pop suppliers who, who do have some Walmart accounts, to be RFID compliant. And if they're not compliant, they're going to be getting chargebacks. And if anybody in the retail world knows about chargebacks, it's, it's a it's a big uh, hit for small small companies, small suppliers. So um, in that mandate of RFID, they had a bunch of requirements. It has to meet the the GS1 spec for um, the data being sent to them and all that kind of stuff. So if they send it out without verifying it, they run that risk of, of a, an audit by Walmart and a chargeback, which can get costly. Um, so we provided a GS1 verification, a verify application, actually on Rev2 now, we added some new features, um, to allow them to sort of pre-check their, their shipments going out to Walmart to make sure they comply. And that's been just tremendously, um, you know, had a, a tremendous amount of interest, honestly. And I'll just talk quickly, you know, we have data going into this cloud, people are using it, but we're also building out things on the other side to share this data, you know, which can be really verbose RFID data that can be used by other systems. And GS1 Verify is one of those systems that it's kind of evolving. We, I think we're always on, we're already on our second revision and it's only been out a year, right? The customers have come to us. Yeah, we just released uh, some updates, uh, new features, uh, because people are now investing in the hardware and investing in the system itself. And they're saying, hey, this is great, but I really could, you know, also like to export this to Excel so I can see what shipped out and I can even, you know, bring it over into my QuickBooks or, you know, whatever accounting system they're using. Um, so that's like a Rev2 and then, you know, we actively take feature requests. So those those are the things we, we certainly consider. All right, let's go to the next slide and we'll get into Clearstream. Um, so again, we're really just talking in broad strokes here, folks. So if you have questions at the end that are a little more specific, just Type it into the question panel. Panel, I didn't mention that in the beginning. I apologize. But um, Clearstream, our fixed IoT slash you know headless edge solution, has been really successful over the last 10, 14 years, I think it is. And um, why not, we initially released an onboard version for Zebra probably a couple of years ago, and we just did it for the MPNG R700. Dan, why don't you get into the details of why onboard is used? I mean, it's it's commonly confusing to our own internal sales team of, you know, when do I use onboard? When do I use 
uh, you know, traditional Clearstream? When do I put, where do I put things? You know, how does the onboard fit into this puzzle? Yeah, so onboard is an interesting project and I happen to like it a lot, but um, the basic mechanics of it are that Clearstream is now under onboard is now being built to run directly on the reader hardware. So um, from an implementation standpoint and from a maintenance standpoint, you don't have to worry about a Windows server being up all the time to receive this RFID tag read data. You don't have to have the network continuity within your warehouse or even in your Wi-Fi environment. Um, or you might be in an environment where you can bring the reader and get power to it, but you'll never have network until you, you know, bring that back, you bring that reader back into some network environment. So to have the onboard application running right on the reader allows you to literally read tags, even filter tags, um, and send those tags to an endpoint, a network endpoint, when it can, right? So if, if that network endpoint's not available, um, there are a ton of settings for how often and how much you want to save locally on the disk of the reader or in the, in the memory of the reader. Um, and then what it does in the background is looks for that connection or availability of connection to send that data to a configure on that endpoint. So by default, it sends it to our cloud, which is nice because it's a, a nice place to collect your, you know, all transactional data. But you can also override that, that endpoint and send it to some web service you might have that's ready to receive that uh, RFID tag read data. So it's been tremendously popular, like you mentioned in the FX series, 75 and 9600. Um, and this year was, you know, it was a good milestone to hit uh, releasing into the Impinj R700. And, um, and we can talk about future of that in 2024 as well. Yeah, and I, I don't know if we talk about it 2024, but what is the bare min? Um, I know there's, uh, we always come to you with the devices and like, you know, hey, listen, what about this running onboard? And you guys say, no, I can't versus this one. Oh, this would be a good solution because onboard is really not just about RFID. It's about other edge devices. Like what yeah, is the bare min for one of those devices? Yeah, so... So it's it's currently released for RFID uh, technology only, but uh, the door is open for BLE or you know even IoT scales or you know whatever whatever is going to be sending data uh, to a to a common gateway or a common router or uh, I'm sorry reader. Um, but there are bare minimums, right? So some readers run like a PLC sort of architecture or like a Arduino, you know, very simple sort of chipsets. Uh, that's not a good candidate. But a lot of the readers, most of the readers, honestly, run under a Linux or sometimes even a Windows embedded type environment where it's a true operating system that can run, you know, run uh, a compatible application. So we wrote uh, Clearstream on board differently than we would a Windows app in the sense that it was it was more in a bare metal language. Right. So we didn't go down to assembly language, of course, but we went down to C++ um, because that is very cross compatible to Linux or Windows or, uh, you know, any other flavor you might want there. Um, it does need to be recompiled, of course, but it makes that that journey a lot easier. So, um, you know, we did that very intentionally. So the readers that wouldn't be compatible are those simple PLC or Arduino type readers just getting raw RFID data. But a lot of these IoT readers or devices we're seeing, whether it be BLE, cameras as such, um, scales, you name it, um, a lot of these sensing devices, maybe they're sensing a vibration. These are perfect candidates for this onboard project to share that data with our, you know, cloud or Clearstream, I assume. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. 2023, again, it wraps up. Um, and this is something I don't think many customers have seen because um, it's really on one-offs with our cloud. Um, and again, the cloud is relatively new, but it's, it's really with the customers that are using it growing very quickly. It's a really powerful solution. Um, but we've been asked, we, again, we started it off with this, like, I don't really know if customers are going to need this. And then within, I think six months, we were just kind of flooded with requests, you know, I, to, to build these because they couldn't get it done internally. If it, they did do it internally, they didn't know how sustainable it was to build this. Then maybe you could just talk a little bit about what we've been doing to optimize these cloud creations for our customers and where we you know, differentiate ourselves versus someone who's building their own internal system. Yeah, yeah, that's that's been a, another interesting journey we had where 2023 kind of set set the tone for the future development. But but it started, I would say, five years ago or so. We had one customer who had, you know, an IT channel challenge internally or just couldn't get his team you know, available to do this. And he needed to, to have sort of a global endpoint for, for traveling readers. Right. So they needed to communicate from all outside networks that he couldn't really control. So you could do a VPN, you could do all this thing, but it just wasn't reasonable. So. Spinning up the cloud there, um, you know, one of our first was a little bit more manual than 
uh, up till about 2021, 2022, where we started scripting it. We put a lot of effort into making that an automated process where it's now still requires a tech person, uh, but maybe it's 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 almost a, a button click to spin up a new site, whereas it would have been six or eight hours you know, in the past. Um, and that's a big deal for us because now we can set up uh, proof of concept sites a lot easier. So there's not a big financial investment for us on that side to do a proof of concept. And that's been proven over and over. Um, so that 2023, again, sort of laid the framework or the groundwork for making that even easier. Um, and that has a huge advantage on the sales side, I think, you know, Brad, of course you can. Comment yeah. On and, and on our side, it's, a, you know, in the past, we, we didn't really understand or get the idea of that. This is a large organization we're selling to. Why, why can't they yeah. integrate this or build their system out and, you know, use our traditional connect process. And then we quick, once we had the product out there, we quickly learned they maybe didn't want to go through the, you know, maybe it's the security protocols or all the headaches of making that connection. So the cloud really gave them an opportunity to get outside of their own network and take advantage of this RFID and barcode data that maybe their backend system didn't give them all the granular details that they wanted. So that's where it's been going. But over the year, the last year especially, we've, we've, we've I don't want to say landed, but we've started working with some really big organizations with some major security risks. So we actually developed what we're calling, the. we went from our basic cloud, which is pretty simplistic, into our premier cloud. And um, maybe you could talk a little bit about that, Dan. You know, yeah, well, that's a big deal too, the, right? So you know, it's, it's kind um, of interesting. Yeah, the cloud uh, is a great opportunity for us and it's, it's a great product for our customers and, and partners. Um, but it puts a lot of responsibility in us to be um, compliant to security requirements and, and uh, authentication for logins and things like that. So again, 2023 uh, saw us with a lot of customers, bigger customers, not only needing audit results, so we have you know our quarterly scans and our daily code scans, um, but they need to do authentication. Now all of a sudden they say, well, that's great if we have a PTS cloud where we have users and, and roles and things like that, but we don't want to manage your user uh, list with our user list. So can you can you integrate to our Active Directory as an example? You know, so we can authenticate, you know, John Smith at acme.com against um, a defined Active Directory server on their side. So if there's a layoff or he leaves or whatever, they can immediately remove him there and he's he's removed from our cloud. So that that was a big step, and that's all. It became more of a plug-in concept. So. The idea of a premier cloud allows you this sort of this a la carte uh, set of features, one of which is security, right? So you can have single tenant versus multi-tenant databases as part of your premier cloud. You can have um, single or multi-tenant servers and this authentication. Some customers, some of our can, big customers- can just to, to stop you for a second, because I yeah. know we always, can you just describe what a single tenant is versus a multi-tenant for those that yeah, are not sure. as I mean, it, it's, savvy as you are? Once I describe it, it'll be self-explanatory, but imagine you're living in an apartment building with 30 units um, and you're a tenant in that building. If you want to use our basic cloud server, you might be a tenant among you know 10 or 12 other tenants within this building where the building is the server essentially. Um, and that's really very safe and they're very isolated generally, but some of our bigger customers still say, no, we want, we want to be the only tenant in your building. So we'll set up a server where they're the only uh, resident of that server, right? And so that's, they don't that trust their neighbors necessarily, or they're not in know. a position to trust their neighbors. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't blame them for it, but it's, um, it, it gives them an absolute no questions asked. There's no way there can be a violation of security. Um, and that's one of the a la carte things I talked about with the Premier uh, Cloud, you know, the security and the customizable authentication. So one of our customers wanted 16 character minimum password which it makes me cringe a little bit, but um, I just picture a lot of passwords of passwords plus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight at the end. But um, the idea that we wouldn't implement that necessarily in our core subscriptions, because it's a little bit intrusive for most of our users, but latching that onto a premier cloud uh, feature for authentication allows them to take advantage of our cloud while still satisfying their, um, their own internal authentication requirements. So again, that's like an a la carte option, which you know, yeah, again, that's, that's a really great explanation. Set up in 2023. It makes yeah. sense because we always hear tenant, multi-tenant, we're on the calls and I'm sure a lot of our customers are on the calls too. And you're, you may not really fully understand it. I think it breaks it down and makes it really understandable. Um, one of the things that you guys are doing a lot of from the request of the sales team is these data integrations on the other side. So we have data coming in from our own systems, but you, 
we're trying to get the data back and forth from the cloud, certain data, not all of it, into other systems. So, you know, what are some of the systems you guys have been working with over the last year? You can mention all of them. Yeah. So, you know, again, being 2023 framework year, um, we set the groundwork for receiving that data from Tracer Plus and Clearstream, which is frankly very easy because we've been doing it for 20 years. Um, but then that data lives in our cloud, and we had a ton of requests for different integrations. So, integrating to their SAP ERP system or HP Asset Center or um, you know, some very vertical type API systems that wouldn't be household names, but are very important to our customers in those verticals. Um, we see this over and over again, that the data is gonna land on our cloud and it has to go somewhere. Typically it needs to be you know, sort of manipulated and massaged into a new format. Um, so we took the brunt of that and we became almost like a reflection server, right? Where we get the data in, we store it as a transaction because that's still valuable, right? From an audit trail perspective or whatever. But then we can also either on a timed sort of interval or even on an event driven interval, send that data to SA, their SAP instance or to some other server that they have. Um, and that integration uh, in 2022 and previous was sort of per customer. It was, it was kind of custom. In 2023, we spent a lot of time uh, building that engine to allow that reflection to happen a little bit easier. And I expect uh, even more improvement in 2024 uh, in that regard. Well, I just noticed we spent a half an hour talking about 2023, so there's really a lot going on there. I don't think we planned it that way. And um, I know both of us are not used to sitting down this long. We, no, we went busy. Right. last night quickly at around 10 o'clock, what we're going to talk about. And I, both of us noted that we were wandering around <laughs> talking, so we're not good. We both are very active when we're um, speaking. Uh, anyway, so on to 2024, we'll sit the next slide. This is really the heart of this and what we're trying to do. Uh, well, we're yeah, we can go right through that. We, we talked about most of those. Um, you know, we have a lot of different systems out there from the cloud. Uh, we'll talk about those next. But what, you know, what are we doing with RTLS? That's really one of the things that we hear a lot of people talk about. Um, but traditionally, customers, you know, either have to have an internal programming team that's massive, like the size of Walmart, or they have to have a budget the size of Walmart to put one of these systems in. We know through some of our own manufacturers that you know they put these systems out there and there's six figures just to take a look at it. I mean, so we're looking at the Zebra ATR 7000, we're looking at the Pinj XRA. We're gonna come out with something really exciting this year that you know rolls RTLS into just regular old Clearstream. And um, maybe we could take a look at that, Lindsay, quickly, and then Dan, you can talk about it. Perfect. Yeah, so I, you, you kind of need to hit the nail on the head with a couple of different things. So the RTLS systems typically, as they exist now, are big gorillas, right? And that's a big gorilla on the financial side, where we, we talk about six-figure implementations, but also on the delivery timeline. You know, you're looking at 18 to 24 months type delivery um, on a system that might be overkill for a lot of customers. You know, they, they do need real time, they do need location, but maybe they don't need it down to the you know, one foot resolution. Maybe they need to just know it's on in, in a certain corner of a room or something like that. That data is readily available um, in a much simpler way is, is our premise, right? So we're saying that. So we have uh, actively in development now for 2024 delivery, uh, if all goes according to plan, uh, the idea to make that uh, available. So it, it'll be within the Clearstream framework. So there's no hardware changes anticipated um, for the most part, um, we have a ton of customers on ATR 7000s already. Um, and then even using Clearstream to feed that data would, would be very similar. But what that what happens to that data next is, is kind of the special sauce we're, we're, we're planning on and working on. So this screenshot is, is uh, just a quick demo we did, I think a few weeks ago, sort of alpha level ready, let's call it, you know, um, not quite ready for prime time, but it's uh, proof of concept at this point. So it shows, I think this is our demo room. That looks like our demo room table. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> so it's a, it's a configurable <laughs> map that allows you to see within that room, and this is a 30 by 30 square foot room, let's say, um, where the tags are relative to a, a, you know, a given X, Y point of zero, zero. Um, so this screenshot is kind of an idea of that. And then within each of those tag IDs, which might be meaningless to people, are more attributes about that tag that you can click on. Of course, we can't show that, but you would click on that tag and see more information. So that's, so, you know, that's. Just, I'm sorry to interrupt him, but so basically what we're doing is in the past, we might have an ATR mounted in the center of this room and it, we could say, hey, listen, 
everything's in this room. And we love the ATR and the X-ray because you just plug them in. You don't need to do a lot of wiring. They're power over Ethernet. Um, so we've been using a lot, but we're not taking advantage of those devices necessarily with all of their, you know, I don't even know how many antennas are in there, but you can really get granularity. What kept us away from that was be exactly what we talked about earlier was that we thought or we initially were told we had to go through certain software to access this. And you guys actually went below that, so it's all clear stream controlled. Is that what you guys are doing, or am I wrong about that? Yeah, well, that goes back to that licensing thing. So there's a lot of technology out there that's that's available for us to use, and, and we've been approached to partner with, but they have their own internal licensing requirements, and frankly, some of their specs change quite frequently, so it's it's not always ideal for us to integrate that if if, if it's a moving target. You know, that, that doesn't make for a good deliverable for us. So what we did, you know, a little bit obnoxiously and a little bit arrogantly, was said, well, we can figure this out, right? How hard can it be? Uh, you know, it got a little harder than we thought, but um, there's a lot we can do from the physics of an RFID tag read. Um, and the ATR offers us a lot more information that allows us to consume it in a better way. Um, so it's it's kind of like good data in can, can give us good data out, uh, which you wouldn't necessarily get with a single reader, although we're working on some of that stuff too. Um, so yeah, we, we kind of went lower than that, that third party provided software uh, almost like an artificial intelligence kind of level um, to make this happen. And it's been proven to be really, really good results. So I'm, I'm very happy with, you know, how that's going so far. And the idea behind this, just to clarify it for everybody, this is not just about UHF RFID readers. It's not just about Zebra. It's not just about Impinge. Really what we see our role as is providing agnostic uh, solution that can work with, you know, any best in class hardware. So essentially you could, you know, put a uh, FX9600 in the room and give it a point and say, hey, listen, if we're getting reads at this level, we know it's in this corner. Isn't that the idea? And, and it's also a lot of these solutions require developers or a team of engineers to come in and lay out this room. Aren't you guys working on mapping that customers can put yeah, in? Yeah, space? exactly. Those are, the, those, are the, those are the big things that make that project timeline go out to 18 to 24 months and make it go into six figures. And, and, and a lot of it's good and, and the end result is great, but, um, I think a lot of that could be made easier. So the idea of using a, a, a lower cost or budget kind of reader, you have to accept you're not going to get quite as accurate data, but we're working on some things to, to combine the information from multiple readers, for example. Let's imagine you could have three uh, FX9600s that we could offer triangulation sort of uh, information. Those are the kind of things we're working on. It's really, really exciting. It's a it's re-energizing my math background, to be honest. There's a lot of math in there. <laughs> yeah, a lot of math. But also, I think that's what really underlines what we're all about. Um, a lot of these other solutions require you guys, Dan, to put them in. The, the goal between what we're doing is to get, so I don't want to say anyone, you you really need a little bit of a technical background, but you don't have to be a developer to, to deploy this system, right? Well, that's, I mean, that's one of our core business models, right? With Tracer Plus, I think our marketing tagline, maybe, you know, Lindsay would say it, but it's something like you don't need to be a developer to do this. That's the idea, right? With all our tools, that's that's the idea is that, you know, you know your problem, right? You even know your problem can be solved by RFID, but you're not quite sure how to do it. That's that's where we hope Clearstream comes in. And over the 24 years coming up, um, you know, we've seen that to be true. Our customers really embrace that, that flexibility and knowing the problem and they know Tracer Plus can help them solve it. Or clear stream in this case. So, you know, this is our sales and marketing side. We're probably most excited about this. Lindsay, you can go to the next slide. But, uh, you know, if you guys are too, please let us know. We're still, we always have an active timeline. Um, you know, we have custom projects coming in, but we have our core product projects, and this is one of them. Um, another thing I know we're always talking about, and I, I mentioned it a little bit, we, we're trying to be that home for taking best in class edge. IoT solution data and giving it a hub to live in so it could be fed to pre-existing systems or our own cloud. Um, what other types of devices are we looking at over the next year, Dan, to integrate with ClearStream? Uh, there are a few on the short list. Uh, I won't mention them by name because they're not, you know, fully evaluated yet. But other RFID readers, uh, we're looking at two gateways uh, for BLE, um, and those are the three. That I mean, that's probably ambitious to get done in 2024 anyway. So. That's roughly where we're looking, but I'd love to get at least one BLE reader in there or BLE gateways. Yeah. We support a couple now, but I, we BLE is like why the gateways that you know it's a little bit of the wild wild west. We're always looking for best in class there, so 
Yeah, mentioned. gateways is a different world for sure. Uh, yeah. and, and just to clarify, I, I bring up a good point. We do support those already in the Clearstream environment. What I meant specifically was uh, Clearstream on board, right? So it can run right on the gateway. Um, right. Just because we've seen such an advantage in having that option. So the next three bullets kind of all go hand in hand a little bit. Um, but if you looked at our product stack right now, it's kind of disjointed, I would say. Um, to beat us up a little bit, uh, we we put things out and didn't fully understand how they were going to be used and where it was going to go. And I would say over the last few years, we we quickly learned that we had to make it easier. Our goal is always to make it easier for the end user to manage their users, their devices, and their data. Um, so we did a lot, and we're working on doing a lot in the subscription management portal. So it makes it easier for the admin over the next year to see his devices, see his users. For our end users, they can see more. But even more importantly, our resellers will be able to manage all of their users and our OEM partners will be able to manage all their users and their different accounts within that. Dan, why don't you just give a, you know, get into that a little bit more of where you guys are looking, you know, analytics, anything else you guys are looking into adding yeah, to those. Yeah, products. I mean, it all stems from the idea, you know, Clearstream and Tracer Plus have always been considered separate products, but in reality, there's a lot of complementary use of those in one account. So with the original thinking, we had a Clearstream portal for subscriptions, we had a Tracer Plus portal for subscriptions, and they weren't considered as useful to be combined, right? Because the users are different, the readers are, you know, they're not human readers logging in, so it's, it's kind of a different interface. Um, but then our partners told us otherwise. <laughs> and they said, look, you know, <laughs> managing all this is great, but it's tough, so can we get it in one spot? Especially if, if we have resellers who have end users, they wanted that hierarchical management, right? So they wanted to be able to see just their customers, for example, and be able to tickle them for uh, subscription renewals and things like that. So the portal does a good job of that now, I would say, but we're trying to get it all under one. So we have the cloud product, we have Clearstream, Tracer Plus, um, all uh, being designed now to report to one portal and you can, you can sort of drill down by product. And of course, for OEMs, the branding of that is, you know, would just be another product that they can manage. Um, yeah, and I, I, I look around and I see other, I would call them competitors or other, you know, vendors out there designing things. And sometimes they put everything in one product on the edge. So your mobile app is the same as your fixed RFID app with the same name. And I, they're really totally different processes. Yeah. So we're kind of trying to take the best of both worlds, I would assume. So you can see both those applications up in the top and who's using and what's going on in the health. But we're in the deployment. We're we're kind of rolling it all up into the cloud, so you can do these different things in different places, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, because I, it, it's very easy, and we have to be careful of this. But it's very easy to to sort of make Clearstream and Tracer Plus, for example, you know, jack of all trades, master of none kind of thing. Um, but if you think about the data, especially when it comes to RTLS, that concept for Trace Plus doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Although I could argue it does. But the data is very structured very differently. It's got a tag read and a power, and it's all this different data. Um, what what we're doing with the um, the integrated platform, I guess, or, or the really the data API falls under more, is taking that data coming in is almost like a, just a generic IoT stream, and allowing it to exist as its own entity, you know, as its own identity, but be able to be able to complement other data coming in and and then you know combine it to even reflect it out to some other service. So that could be true for mobile RFID data collected via Tracer Plus with Clearstream data collected via Fixed Reader or just some other data that you know, our users custom created, right? Uh, with a custom yeah. session in Tracer Plus desktop. Um, all that data coming into one landing point and, and accessible to our data API, both in and out, bi-directional, um, is a big, big push for 2024. Those, those are, you know, I think these bullet points sum it up pretty quickly or pretty easily that that's going to keep us busy for 2024 for sure. Yeah, and I, I think the next one, which uh, again, we in the sales and marketing side maybe didn't get right away, but the the idea between current connect product kind of lives on a desktop. That's where it started. It's actually called ODBC link. If you remember 20 years ago, I was like, what's ODBC mean? Right. <laughs> Horrible naming we used to do. Um, that was before we had on the desktop. You could put it up in the cloud if you wanted to and run it, but it was a little cumbersome even for our own cloud users. You guys are talking about putting in something into the cloud, which is a dynamic connect that's smart. It can sense what's being developed in desktop in the cloud once that's yeah. there. But more importantly, for our own internal purposes, which 
it's a little bit selfish, but that's the first area we're going after. So we're going to eat our own dog food. Um, we're going to have this dynamic connect live in the cloud for our mobile customers who have a cloud, right? So that'll make it really easy for you guys to make the connections. And maybe you can go through why you guys did that and the security reasons and, you know, even the support reasons why that is so important. Well, so I, there's all those all those taglines are important. Um, the security is becoming increasingly important because IT groups of our you know end users uh, who live in a different department, for example, download Traceless Connect and it, it's meant to run on their local intranet on a certain network port they call it, right? Basically, just a channel of connection between the mobile device and and some server. Uh, they're getting a lot tighter for, for good reason on allowing those third-party apps to, to live. So our, our support overhead becomes a lot of, did you arrange for a firewall exception for this software? And did you talk to your IT department and all this kind of stuff? It's always that first step. It's almost always the same conversation. Um, yet, on the other hand, if they were to create their desktop application um, and get it on a mobile device and just press a sync button that sends it to our cloud, that's all over HTTPS, just like you're navigating to google.com or yahoo.com or whatever it might be. Um, that's a lot more friendly to security because it's got its own built-in security. Um, so then when they get that data in the cloud, that's one less thing they have to deal with when they're trying to do their proof of concept um, because they can just see it right away. Um, and then that opens a conversation about how do they get it to their site in a final destination type deal. Um, but it makes it much easier to get set up and, and running. And if, if the PTS cloud is their final destination, that's great news for us. That's what we'd love to hear. Um, and that's often going to be true. Then you're done, right? Then you don't have to do anything. Yeah, and I guess the end goal is to have the – you're designing that mobile app, but at the same point, it's building a very complex cloud behind the scenes because it knows what you're doing on the mobile app. So that's, you know, that's the holy grail in my humble opinion of, you know, an application generator, right? Yeah, yeah. The goal, I mean, the goal from the end user perspective is to make that all seamless. On our side, of course, that's a fair amount of work to do to make it seamless and sort of intelligent in 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 the data being collected and how it's being shared. Uh, but that's you know that's the cross we bear. That's the solution we want to provide. Um, and and we're very very close to um, having that available, at, you know, as an engine at least. And then later in the year, we're going to have that be uh, user presentable or user um, interface presented to the end user. All right. I, I think we we kind of went through everything in a very high level. If you guys have questions now, now is the time to uh, put them in there. Um, it's pretty exciting. I'm looking at the questions we have already. We have people from Mexico, India, um, partners from there. One of the questions came out about MotionWorks. Um, MotionWorks is a solution that is in that six-figure range, I would say, that you know some people will use. I'd say Clearstream is a direct competitor of it. But we've been integrating it with it occasionally because of the power of Tracer Plus and Clearstream to quickly do things. Um, so the question is, motion work integration for people in asset tracking and manufacturing, is that something you guys can do? I think we're doing it already. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was an interesting environment, too, because a lot of our competitors are, are network required, right? And, and we didn't touch on this, but a, a big strength of Tracer Plus and Clearstream, like Clearstream on board, is that we don't have to have a network, you know, um, in place actively available but motion works did and they were in an environment where security was super tight and they weren't allowing any network or something so they were using tracer plus collected data in a batch mode right so you're scanning barcodes and rfid tags storing it locally on the device and then syncing it to motion works um in a, in a hardwired fashion right so not over wi-fi or anything like that motion works didn't have that capability and, and to be honest it's sort of an edge scenario but Trace Plus is naturally fit, and then we did that MotionWorks integration uh, via the MotionWorks API, which was, you know, a pretty solid API. Um, yeah, perfect. Uh, one of the questions was, and this is exactly it: environmentally sensors, temp and humidity, and billy. One of the those are the things we're working for. Are, are you guys going to do that? And and we are already. There are even so it kind of goes in two places. Um, there's first BLE devices and UHF RFID devices or tags, let's call them, not devices. These are the tags, the actual things we're placing on on the, the um, equipment, assets, people, whatever it is, that are becoming more advanced as time goes on. And we're already working with Zebra and others on parsing out that data. So Dan, maybe you can talk about, you know, there's two really paths to this. There's the device that's listening for it that we're integrating with. So it could be an environmental ses sensor, but there's also the tagging that is capturing it and then feeding it up to maybe a more traditional device like a UHF RFID reader or a BLE gateway. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, when we talked about the onboard, you know, considerations we're we're making, um, that was really at the gateway level. But in a broader perspective, um, I would love to see all those, you know, little gadgets and little IoT devices uh, participate in this in this data exchange, right? So, uh, looking at support for MQTT protocols, which is like a an IoT messaging protocol. Um, would be something we're looking at. You know, whether we do that in 2024 or not is, is kind of open to debate. Um, but it's very important for us and really for the industry in general to have those um, those specs be defined before we would we would tackle trying to solve it. Otherwise, you're just you know you're you're kind of wild wild west. I think somebody mentioned before, Brad. Um, yeah. So that yeah that those are the things we're looking at though. If you, if somebody was mentioning about IoT devices, I didn't see the exact question. Yeah. Uh, so the next one is about the ATR 7000 demo we showed. It's actually a video on YouTube. It's simplistic. It's what you would see in a trade show booth. But this is kind of the debate we get into in a software company. Um, if anyone saw the latest BlackBerry movie, uh, I saw it on a plane ride. It's really great. And it's the sales and marketing team going at the engineers. And it's really a great evolution of a product. Um, we, ne we decided never to go with BlackBerry. But um, you know, we look at a demo like that. We're like, we want to sell it right away. That's the best thing. Then the, the real reason behind what we're doing is so it's not just one ATR or one device. It's a bunch of ATRs working together. And that's where the, the work comes in. Can you talk a little bit about that and why we're doing that? Well, there's, I mean, there's a couple layers to that. So whenever we take on new tech, which is pretty much our whole life, right, is, is somewhat, maybe not bleeding edge, but leading edge uh, tech is what, where we're involved. There's a lot of stuff that goes behind the scenes, a lot of hours spent on research that gets thrown away, frankly, a lot of times. Um, and a lot of sort of just is it possible type type work, right? Um, so that's part of what the ATR, and that's been a sort of a skunk works project, we call it, for, for years now, working on locationing and, and real-time tracking and even directionality, those kind of things. Um, and that ATR screenshot you see is is a is the successful output of those kind of research projects. A lot of them, like I said, you know, get tossed. They're just not feasible or not viable, or they're just not sellable, right? We have to, we do have to pay the bills. Um, but so when the sales reps see some of that stuff, they get very excited and want to sell it tomorrow. But but that was really just a proof of concept, not really ready for mainstream work. So once we get the buy-in from the sales reps and, and Brad's, you know, Brad's vision of of where that's valuable in the market. That's where it goes into the next st stage of a project and moves into the active development, which is where that RTLS stuff is now. And, and a lot of my vision, guys, comes from you and your feedback to our sales reps. So we we really do listen. We're not hearing for it from you, and we come up with something there's crickets. We kind of back off on it. We say maybe we don't have something yet. Maybe we're a little early on this. Um, one of the questions uh, was about notifications, and this is you know, can we do zoning and things like that? Um, we're doing that already with traditional ClearStream, and we do a lot of that, especially in manufacturing processes, with traditional ClearStream alerts, uh, controlling um, um, actuators and such. Dan, can you just talk about you know where that's being controlled and how it's controlled in ClearStream, and you know what an end user versus a programmer can do to control things? Um, yeah, and it's 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 found, we want to we want to keep the product to be very end user friendly, but we don't want to handicap a more technical developer. So. Some of the things we do existing in Clearstream Windows and Clearstream on board and you know um, the future cloud products is allow this concept of notifications uh, to be configurable and sent and 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 sent out of the system based on certain triggers, right? So you could have an email alert if you get a certain tag read, maybe an employee was let go and he's all of a sudden in a warehouse. Um, you could have an assembly line that got shut down because it didn't get a tag read, right? That should be an email alert or a text message alert or even just an, uh, a, a packaged message going to some other web service. Um, all of those things exist actually in Clearstream Windows now, but they're they're fairly technical um, for an end user. To be honest, our end users kind of amaze me lately. Um, no, I think that the, the non-technical users are a lot more technical than they give themselves credit for, but those are all the kind of things. Technical that ones aren't as technical as they claim to be. <laughs> I, know, I know, right? Well, that's true too, we have both sides, but um, those have existed in Clearstream Windows for, you know, almost forever um, that's only going to be expanded on in in the you know the different cloud design and api um, integrations that we do um someone's asking us to pick a favorite reader i i don't think we'll do that again we try to be agnostic uh and i really think in the rfid reader i'll go a little sideways here but in in the rfid manufacturer world they, 
I think you'll see in our world that we try to, you know, pick best in class and that's what we talk about, but there's different reasons someone might like an ATR versus an X-ray and vice versa. Um, what we're doing will work on both, um, you know, the proof in the pudding when they go out into the field, which is more sensitive for certain tags. And that's another thing, the way they build in the readers, you know, some work better with other tags and some work better with these tags. Are there any plans to handle any other readers? We're always looking at other readers. Um, on the mobile side, we're always looking at best in class and we're listening to the customers. Um, a mobile integration with Tracer Plus is typically a lot more of an effort because we have a, a, a lot more options in how to use the RFID. And, Tracer Plus, if you get into it, there's mul multiple layers to it, millions of ways to configure it, where when you get into ClearStream, it's very, I don't want to call it simplistic, but there's you know, less choices, as Dan talked about with the data. So we really look at the mobile readers pretty closely, and um, we go with best in class. But if anyone has one that they want us to look at, I know we're looking at um, possibly Cypher Lab next year. Uh, Chainway could be one of those. Um, Dan, maybe you could talk about the effort and you know how we talked about it earlier, but there's the you know looking at the uh, the APIs and how you guys go about that and make that decision. Yeah, I mean there's a lot there, you know that's pretty deep technically, but we have to always keep in mind that Tracer Plus is an app that is meant to run out of the box on any Android device, right? And we go back way further than the Play Store even supports as a minimum. Um, but whenever we integrate to a you know, more featured um, Android devices, an example like a Zebra with an embedded barcode scanner or embedded RFID, we typically have to build in that support in code into this product, the generic off the shelf Tracer Plus product. And we also have to intelligently at runtime decide if we're on a Zebra device or if we're on some generic Samsung Galaxy, right? Um, mm -hmm. The more support we add for those, the, the more bloated the app gets, the more, um, you know, finicky it can get depending on the quality of the API. So we do spend a lot of time evaluating the quality of the APIs and and the market penetration of those devices. So if we hear a lot about, you know, um, one particular device, like I see a Chainway reader request here. If we hear a lot about that, then we start saying, hey, wait, maybe there's something here we have to look at it. Um, but it's not, a, it, even then we might decide it's not feasible. So there's a lot that goes into that. One of the questions, which I'll ask, this will be the last one, but how do you see the Walmart mandate for RFID on, you know, in place will expedite RFID architecture and the TPP specs? Um, I think anything Walmart does really highlights it. Uh, we are seeing manufacturers for Walmart. I mean, obviously the big boys will have their teams and they've been doing it already and they know a lot about RFID, but the, it's, it's, it's forcing smaller suppliers to really become educated really quickly. From what I understand, they get a 200 page manual about the man mandate and then are asked to complete it. So that's where our partners have been coming in and helping them. But at the same point, they're seeing how it can work internally. So, you know, as they're using GS1 to validate all the tags, they're saying, well, why can't I do my inventory audit? Like do my own inventory of my subcomponents with this. This is great. I, I just scanned, you know, 10,000 product about to go to Walmart in a couple minutes. That used to take me a day how can i use that so um I, I don't know if you want to add to it dan but i, I think it's it's kind of interesting people are learning the li lingo they're they're learning about you know how um you know lock a tag unlock a tag it's it's yeah there's a lot there yeah i mean I, the only thing I would add is, is that i lived through the edi mandate back in the uh mid 90s let's call it with some of the retail environments. So that was like, an, the EDI stands for electronic data interchange. So it wasn't auto ID necessarily, but it was very structured data. And that was a nightmare for a lot of people. So if Walmart gets really tough with this RFID mandate, it's gonna be a wake up call for a lot of folks who are not ready for it. So I feel like on the sale, you know, from the sales side, Brad, you guys might wanna be prepared for just a flood of requests yeah. to, get, you know, to get that out there. And our partners are doing a great job of handling it and our team is all, as well. I, I just really think, and it, it goes back to when we did, I'll talk about an install we did where we used RFID to help a building in, build a building in Manhattan. And we were working with subcontractors who were pad and paper. And they started using RFID and they actually were mandated by a big construction company to use it. And out of the 20 that used it, a, a few held onto it and said, holy cow, this is helping our 
internal processes. So I think those that latch onto it are going to become more competitive. Those that don't and are like those that didn't create a website years ago for their business because they didn't think it was a real deal. I mean, RFID is the real deal. Um, and right. if you've done an inventory audit with a barcode scanner versus doing an inventory audit with an RFID scanner, you'll understand it really quickly. Um, with that, I think we'll end this. Uh, I'm going to encourage everybody. I know we do a lot of emails and sending folks, uh, you know, what we have going on. But I also encourage everybody to follow us on LinkedIn, which is really becoming our most popular channel, um, you know, to show folks what we have coming up next. And, and it's a little you know, less in your face versus an email. So you can go to there and interact with us. Um, definitely want to hear from you what you think, you know, what maybe what we're not looking at that we should be looking at um, and be concerned about. We we're, we're, we always have open ears. That's one thing we really strive to do and listen to our customers and our partners about where they see it going. So, you know, let's open up the dialogue after this. Um, comment on the video. We're going to put it up on YouTube in a day. Um, try to keep the comments nice, though. Uh, Dan, I want to thank you. I know you don't do a lot of these and it's maybe a little bit painful to do it um, from the, but you're really good at it. Um, I'd love to see more of you doing these. Um, thanks. Thanks, Lindsay, for putting together and thanks everybody for joining us. That'll be it. Thank, Close you, it yeah. thank you guys. I look forward to any feedback you guys have. So yeah, <clears throat> thanks for joining us. I look forward to an exciting 2024. Can't wait. Yep. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.